Hello, my name is Dean Peterson. I'm here today to help you install OpenShift 4 on RHEL 8, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8. I'll be using the UPI or User Provisioned Infrastructure mode. That simply means that I won't be using the cloud, something like Amazon or Microsoft Azure. Rather, I'll be using the machines behind me. I'll be running on bare metal. Rather than run directly on bare metal, though, I'll be targeting the KVM and LiveVirt virtualization platform. So, if you're familiar with the installation process of OpenShift 3 using Ansible, you'll notice that the installation process of OpenShift 4 is significantly different, and that's the reason for this tutorial. I had a difficult time finding the exact right steps to get OpenShift 4 up and running in, well, a development environment or using bare metal and UPI in general. So that's what this tutorial is all about. It's about helping you with that process. I just want to mention just a little bit about why OpenShift 4 is so different. I won't go into too much detail, but I think it helps just to understand a little bit about that. So Red Hat acquired a company called CoreOS, and CoreOS has an operating system called Container Linux. And Container Linux is used to run container environments and they had specifically something called Tectonic which is similar to OpenShift and it had an installation process it was it was something that they once it was installed they used Container Linux and this idea and this concept of an immutable operating system or immutable OS that is not modified by administrators and so when it comes time to update or make changes uh, and provide changes and updates to that operating system. It's much easier because the operating system is known to be in a specific state. So we took a lot of the best parts of Container Linux and Tectonic and then we mixed that with Atomic uh, Host and OpenShift and now we have Red Hat Container or Red Hat CoreOS and the new installation process uses some of the tools from Tectonic and CoreOS, things like Ignition for configuration, and the process has changed significantly. So this tutorial, I just wanted to mention some of that in case you're a little confused as to, well, geez, where did Ansible go, or why is this so different? It's because we've taken a lot of the, the knowledge and, and the best of the open source community and put that into this new version of OpenShift to give you things like operators and make the you know make the experience a lot more seamless with Kubernetes and the operating system so that you can keep it running and update it and make all of that process seamless. So I think that's important to know. Now that being said, let's move on to the actual installation process. And I'll I, I want to I want to mention that. I've spent a great, you know, I wish that there was a tutorial like this out there that kind of went from the very basics on up all the way through the entire process without glossing over anything or assuming too much uh, knowledge. And that's really what this is. This is going to make sure that if you follow along, there's, n there's really no way you can mess it up and then you will at least have a development environment that won't paint you into a corner and you can use to build upon and and run your applications and and kinda of kick the tires for OpenShift 4. Alright, let's get started. I'm gonna switch over to sharing my my screen now. I'll stay in the in the bottom corner. Alright, so I'll be using these two locations to get most of the instructions for how to do this. Now, if you're looking, if you've been looking for how to install OpenShift 4, you may have come across a few tutorials online. So there's this one, um, if that looks familiar to you. I would not follow this. You don't necessarily need to go down to this level. This goes into some fairly detailed explanation on setting up a DNS server using DNS mask, so two separate networks as well as the load, uh, you know, the load balancers, some of the, you know, the that low-level 
prerequisite work that OpenShift 4 requires, it's not necessarily you know needed anymore. You don't have to do that manually. Now that this tutorial in the actual OpenShift GitHub repository exists. So there's a libvert how-to. But I found that there are some gotchas, some significant ones, and it can take you a couple of days to figure out. And I'll get you past those using so a combination of this tutorial and my notes here. And I'll share this document along with this video in the uh, in the in the public location. All right. So the first step is make sure you have all of these libraries installed. Now I do actually have some of these things installed already, uh, so I won't necessarily need to run this, but go ahead and run this command. Get those packages installed. That's the first step. The second step is to get KVM and LiveVert running and installed. Make sure that you have LiveVert development. A lot of times that gets missed, but we'll need that in one of the other steps when we are compiling the OpenShift installer program. So we need this LiveVert development package. So go ahead and copy this command and then go ahead and run it and then just verify that KVM is running and installed correctly you should see output from that command and it should look like that alright now enable libvertd and then start libvertd. So run these two commands here. This one and then this one. And that's fairly straightforward and self-explanatory. For the next step, we'll be using the Network Manager CLI. I like this link here. It shows the full KVM and libvert setup required to have things running smoothly with virtual machines. So I'm going to put these instructions in the document as well, but the link is there. If it's still valid by the time you watch this, this is a good reference. So run the following command to view the available networks. Now I've actually set this up already so I'm not going to be running um, the commands but I just want to show you in context what you would actually do. You'd look for, you know, on my machine I had one Ethernet or NIC card and it was ENS4. So I've just followed the instructions step after step so you would in, whatever your ethernet card is called or your ethernet connection is called ENS 36 uh, ENS 4 in my case you actually run NMCLI connection delete the next just follow exactly what you see here and I'll put these instructions in in the document as well and then you're going to create this new bridge connection. So name it BR0. Just copy that and paste it. Run it. Then here's where I use static IP addresses and I have five static IP addresses assigned to me. Um, I will replace this 192.168.1.12 with my desired static IP address. Now you can use an IP address that's going to be uh, part of your network and then you would put in your gateway as well as your DNS servers. 
Now in my case, I have Comcast Business and I um, my DNS was 75.75.75.75 and 75.75.7676 um, and my gateway was 255.255, um, etc. But you will modify the settings here with what your internet provider requires. Okay. And then you can just run this and then modify ENS again 36 with whatever your connection name is using that BR0 as that new bridge that you created. And then you can bring up the connection and MCLI connection up. And then you will have a new, when you do NMCLI connection show, you'll have that new bridge set up. And that way, any virtual machines that get created and you select that, that bridge connection will be able to access the and share the internet from your ethernet connection. One of the things though, once KVM and Live are up, the default storage pool isn't immediately initialized, I found. Now, I can't show it here, but you'll want to actually log in, if you have a GUI, log in to the RHEL 8 machine, and then just in activities, do a search for vert manager, V-I-R-T dash manager, and start that up maybe you know go into the storage location and that will initialize the default storage location so that you want to make sure when you run a, this command reverse pool edit default that you've got the default storage location here set and um, you know the capacity should be available and um, and that so actually right now that doesn't look right for some reason it's saying that uh, my capacity is is zero so I'm gonna run over there really quick and just check out what's going on and make sure that it's it's set up correctly okay everything's fine Okay, so once you've initialized Vert Manager and then just check that your default pool has information in it, the next step is to install the Go language. Now this is the first place where you're going to run into a gotcha and there really isn't anything in the tutorials about installing the Go language. So you'll run that command to get the Go language installed. Now, I already had it installed. And then the first thing that you'll want to do after that is edit this bash profile. So nano I've already modified it, but you'll want to make sure that you put this export go path equals dollar sign home forward slash go right in between this path and the export path. And exit. And do the same thing now for your bash RC. Before that, the run source bash profile just to make sure that the changes take effect and then you'll also modify bash rc and then put export go path equals home go 
Now, Go is kind of a funny language, and I think it's just assumed that you you know a bit about it. And when you, what we'll do, and we'll need that Go language to compile and build that OpenShift installer to include the LiveVirt platform. That's why we're doing a lot of this, this stuff with the Go language. And there's a gotcha in that you have to make sure that your Go path is set. Now that's not a gotcha. Everyone has to do that if you're, you know, if you're if you're going to install Go. But then with a little, you know, if you don't have any experience with it, you have to understand that everything, so you've got your Go path, which is going to be for me, I'm using the root user, so it's forward slash root, forward slash go, and then all of your code has to go, there has to be another folder under there, so the, the SRC, so source folder. And um, so at this point, after you've made your change to bash RC, and then do, and you do source percent or tilde dot Okay, so now that that's done, your go path, so just echo dollar sign go path, and you'll see what your go path is. Mine is forward slash root, forward slash go. So I'll go to that location. If your path doesn't, doesn't actually exist, if all you have is, is root and go doesn't exist, then go ahead and make go. So make that directory go, and then you'll also have to make the directory source. So make dir src, and then go into that. And now here's the tricky part. You actually, because you're, we're going to be cloning this GitHub repository here. You and it requires the path to be set just right. When you're when you're running, uh, you know, a command that's coming up here pretty soon, that you act, you do have to have. It's very important that you have. So you'd have to make dir. At, at this, so if I take t pwt. I'm at the root go source. You would make dir github.com. Now I already have have it. So, but you would make that directory. You'd go into that directory, and then you also have to make dir the directory OpenShift. So this is very important. If you don't make the directory structure exactly like this, when you when it comes time to run, so I'll show you that command way down here. We're not there yet, but when it comes time to build the installer this command right here if you try to run it without the exact right directory structure it won't it won't work you'll get an error saying that the code is not in the in the go path even though it is all right now that we've so again here, here's our full path. Now we're going to clone. We're going to clone the following directory. So do git clone this at this location. Now that you're at root go source or so whatever your go path is, if it's not root go, so you whatever your go path, source, github.com, openshift, go into the openshift directory, and then go ahead and do a git clone. So you would you would you would do a git clone on that installer. Alright? And once you've cloned it, you'll see not you won't see the install dash dir you'll see installer you go into installer right so this is what you will have cloned so installer 
and it'll have all of this in there. All right. So the next steps are straightforward. I took these instructions, I just copied and pasted them for clarity or ease, but the rest of this is all taken, to, not all the way to the end, but right here in the middle, there's going to be quite a few steps that you can just take directly from the instructions. So the, one of them is make sure that IP forwarding is enabled and if you're using rel 8 it will be at by this point so you won't need to do the next you know the following steps so you can move just verify that it is enabled and then move on to uh, configure livevert to accept TCP connections and to do that you'll modify your livevertd.conf file in the etsy livevert directory to contain this information so you can just replace it wholesale so if you do so nano etsy livevert d.conf apparently there's more than one so you can there's there's there will be a lot of text you can copy move so I you know I copied the original to a new file and then I just pasted this in there and saved it so you would hit control X and then save it all right the next step is just comment or uncomment so go into nano at C sysconfig livevert D and co uncomment this here so that it looks like that and then hit control X and it'll ask you to save the next step would be to restart livevert D so you can restart livevert D you would just paste that in there and then restart and then if you're on rel 8 getting your firewall to accept livevert um, communication is as simple as running this command so you would just go ahead and paste that in there and then hit enter and then it will say success and the next step is is very important you'll set up the DNS overlay now because we're using KVM there are just some things that we want to do to make sure that uh, our our requests are getting routed routed appropriately using DNS mask to do that we would modify the openshift.com file to contain so if I do I'll just show you what mine currently looks like That's what it should look like. And then you will also modify the DNS mask dot, the openshift.comp file under the DNS mask.d directory. And this is where there's another gotcha. Now you can make the change up front or wait till you, you absolutely have to change it. Uh, in a in a subsequent step below so you'll notice that it only tells you at this point to add this server entry to the DNS mask location but let's go in there and look at what mine looks like so 
So I've got so you'll uh, did we okay I I skipped over this but I it's important that I mentioned that you need to pick a base domain and a cluster name they can be whatever you want them to be it's just this name is going to be what um, DNS mask and DNS your local DNS uses to do all of the routing correctly so you can make your base domain anything that you want I'm just choosing abecorn.enterprise web service and then my cluster name is OCP again you can make them whatever you want as long as they don't clash with your local DNS okay so that being said now it's going to have you take your base domain put it in this string so you would replace your base domain so I'm using abecorn.enterprise web service so you would replace it with yours and then you would add that to this Etsy network manager DNS mass.d openshift.conf location right now you'll notice I also have another entry in there and that's because LiveVirt does not support DN Wildfly DNS entries at, for LiveVirt. To get around that, to make sure that your console comes up, so your console requires an extra step or an extra entry in here. So you would add address equals forward slash and then dot apps dot, so just replace so all of this would be the same for you. Just replace abecorn.enterprise web service with your base domain. So you don't have your cluster name in there. You'd still need apps dot and then your base domain. And then you keep these IP addresses exactly as they are. There's no need to change those. All right. So once that change is made, you can go ahead and restart the network manager so you would say at this point reload network manager okay now this is a very important next step I had to modify the installer and I think you will too so by default what I've been reading online is almost nobody is able to complete it without increasing the the timeout limits on the installation process. To change that, to modify that, you need to go into this create.go file in this location. So CD So cd root go source github.com openshift installer cmd openshift dash install and then just modify create dot go in this file look for anything that has a short timeout you'll see the timeouts now I've already modified this file but you'll see timeouts set here to 30 minutes. API timeout you'll want to set to 180. It can take some time to install OpenShift. So once so there's also the bootstrap time. That will be a half an hour by default. Update that to be 180. And then there is a wait for initialized cluster timeout that's set to a half an hour set that to 180 minutes as well and then there's one last one and I set that to 60 minutes its default is 10 minutes but I set that to 60 minutes so look for all of these places where you see time dot minute replace the number in front to be longer
180 minutes and then this last one you can make 60 minutes once that's done you can exit and save and then so we're making these changes prior to doing uh, another command which is this tags live vert you know building the actual OpenShift install because that installer requires these go files and then um, the go files are, are are used to create the installation program and so make your changes prior to making that open OpenShift install file alright I also modify the default memory and CPU that are allocated to the master and the worker nodes and you do that the only place that I found that actually works there's a number of places that have the information that look like if you modify it that it will make uh, make the change but they don't I found that they the only place that that it works to make the change and have it take effect is in this location here this variables libvert oh. so variables by default it's four CPU and six gigs of RAM that is not necessarily enough now you may not have enough to put 16 gigs of RAM at each one of these and 8 CPU but do whatever you can to make sure that you don't get it get into race conditions and have that installation process take too long and end up fail end up failing so I, again I make this 16,000 megabyte or um, 16 gigs and 8 virtual CPU so close that and save it. Now you can go ahead and build the installer. You can run that. So if you run that, it just takes a little while to build. After you after it finishes successfully, again you needed to make sure that your go path and all of that is all of those gotchas are are done correctly that will finish successfully and then you will be able to um, you'll be able to run the OpenShift install but prior to that there is one more gotcha that uh, if you run the installer it won't tell you that you need uh, your SSH key, key but you do so make sure that you generate your SSH key following um, the instructions that are laid out. So if you go to OpenShift um, documentation, so you want to go to OpenShift documentation, go to container platform for, go to installing, go to installing on bare metal, and then there's a section in there. So this isn't in any of these other tutorial locations. I'll put it. I'll, I'll put it in my document here. But if you want, go straight to the source, and you'll find, you know, generating an SSH private key. A lot of this is common knowledge for many of you. But again, I don't want to skip anything for for those that may not be familiar with some of this process. So you'll you'll generate your key using this you know typically it's this path so you'll add this to this it looks like this right ssh key gen the next step is start the ssh agent using this command here you'll get back an agent pid process id and then you'll add your ssh key to the ssh agent it will look something like that and then again this is in this part is down here in the troubleshooting but you do have to do this make sure that you get you know 
your openshift.com file under that DNS mask should look like this with your base domain replacing these two and then you'll restart the network manager and you're finally able then to run so you'll run your manifests command you'll want to generate your manifests prior to doing your actual cluster creation because then there's one more step that you have to do okay so you'll run this command here now I put my install so you'll create an install directory so let me go up a couple show you the directory that I'm under so I create install dir at the same level so when you do your git clone and you pull down the installer directory go to that same level and then create install dir then you can run after you've run and done your build.sh now you have under installer you actually have the openshift install application that you can run and now because you did that you created your ssh key make sure that you highlight that it's the blue blue means it's highlighted right with a little little carrot pointing to it if you hadn't done that you'll end up you'll end up you know freezing and the installation won't be won't finish but you won't get any notification that you don't have an SSH key so just make sure that that's generated and um, because you followed this process and compiled the OpenShift install using that that build.sh file and you made modifications to the go app you know the go files associated with it you'll have this libvert option this platform so go ahead and select that and then put in your base domain again that can be whatever you want it just needs to match what you what you put for all of the rest of the steps and then your cluster name I just put OCP for OpenShift Container Platform and then your pull secret so your pull secret is going to be alright your pull secret okay you'll find a link in here so you'll see I what I pressed on there in um, obtaining the installation program and then click this OpenShift infrastructure providers page make sure you're logged in go to bare metal and you'll see under your account in this location copy pull secret you can go ahead and just paste that right in there hit enter now your manifests you didn't you haven't started the installation process but you'll notice under the install directory you've generated some some files there's just one more step make sure that that you do it you have to run this command and you'll replace so there's a dot here but you'll put in your cluster name that you chose so I chose OCP you'll make sure that you put your cluster name in there because the manifest that you generated 
there is there is uh, so this ingress to your to your console requires that that route that automatically gets generated when you run to generate your manifest it gets your cluster ID in there that has to be removed so we'll go up one level and we'll run that command and just make sure that that cluster ingress o2 config does not have so let's go in there and nano cluster ingress and just make sure that this does not have your cluster name it just has your base domain with apps in front and so that looks correct that's what that sed command did now you're ready and the moment of truth this can take a long time so i'm not going to do this in real time i will stop the video at this point but i will get it started um, before I do that though, let's get to the right directory. Alright. You notice that I have installed DIR. That's the directory I made. You can call your install installation directory whatever you want. Um, but when you ran the, this previous command, you gave it where you wanted it to go and now keep the same installation directory and go ahead and start the creation of the cluster um, sorry I need to oh. I need to copy this guy There we go. So it will take a significant amount of time, and when it's done, I will show you what the output looks like. All right, the installation has finally finished. I, you know, if you do run into an issue, maybe you'll see something like the worker nodes won't come up. You might want to restart the server and then try the install again. And if you don't want to, if you're on your Mac like I was, and you don't want to sit and wait, and you don't want your, your terminal connection to, to end, you can always fire up another terminal and then type caffeinate. So you see caffeinate like that or caffeinate-s to keep the system alive so that these terminals won't die and that way you can you can walk away from your desk and still have that installation running for however long it takes at the end you should you should see something like this I personally like to tail the OpenShift install log and that is in the installation directory that install dash dir when it completes you'll you'll be given a login to the console and then the URL of the console you won't from your Mac be able to just go and copy that into a URL instead here why don't I switch to just video and then run back over to the other machine Let's see if I can show you all right so here are my machines here I don't know if you can see all of them all right I'm just using one of the machines this one down there all right let's log in
All right, I've got the URL here. I can copy and paste that. Oops. Copy. All right, I had actually logged in already. I will log out. This is what you'll see. You'll be given, uh, unless you use Let's, en Let's Encrypt for your certificate um, generation, you will get some warnings. Just go ahead and accept those. And then use the username and password provided in the console after you successfully install. And then you can log in. And you will get your OpenShift dashboard. Okay, and that's it. Hopefully you will now have success, like I did. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Hopefully you'll have success.